No? Okay, so let's start. Uh, very happy to introduce you to Prashant. So Prashant is a student at MIT um, under supervision of Vinod. He works in uh, theoretical cryptography, complexity, zero knowledge, uh, proofs and things like that. So very happy to have him. Let's welcome him and looking forward to the talk. Uh, hey, uh, so thanks for having me over. And this uh, this talk is about some work that I did last summer with these people, like Marshall from uh, from Columbia, Alon Rosan from uh, IDC in Israel, and Manuel from UC Berkeley. And uh, let me start by explaining the terms in the title. Right? Uh, so uh, I will discuss fine grained harness. So what do you mean by fine grained? Uh, by fine grained, I, I refer to the uh, to the field that is uh, uh, it has recently been called fine grain complexity. So what is fine grain complexity? Uh, so we know complexity theory, right? It's, it's the, you study the complexity of problems. You ask, okay, which problems can be solved efficiently, and which problems cannot be solved efficiently. And usually the 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 notion of efficiency that you use is polynomial time. You say that uh, a problem can be solved efficiently if it can be solved in polynomial time. And there are lots of good reasons for doing this, right? Because polynomials are nice in several ways. They compose to give other polynomials, and you can multiply them. It still gives polynomials. But uh, but in a lot of cases, you want to know more. In a lot of cases, uh, uh, you want to mean more specific things when you say efficient. For example, maybe an algorithm that runs in time n cube is really inefficient for your purposes. For maybe your inputs are too big. Right? So fine grained complexity deals with uh, it studies. It, it's a systematic study of. Uh, uh, of the efficiency of solving problems, where your definition of efficiency is much more rigorous, is much more fine-grained. You ask questions like, uh, which problems can be solved in n-squared time, which problems can be solved in n-cube time, and so on. And this has been going on, a systematic study of these things has been going on for uh, for the past 25, 30 years or so. And similar to how in complexity you have all these reductions. Right? Like we can't, uh, so far we don't really know how to prove too many actual lower bounds in complexity theory. But what we have been able to do is we have been able to build up this framework of reductions which say that um, this problem is as hard as this other problem. Problem A is as easy as problem B and so on. And in fact, in complexity people have been able to do these things. People have been able to uh, relate the complexities of several different problems that they are interested in. And, uh, and they have been able to come down to certain problems that seem to be very well connected to lots of other problems. So that, uh, so that if you wanted to study all of these problems, you can just focus your efforts on these few problems. right? And just to give you a flavor of what sorts of problems these are, these are uh, one example is what is called the threesome problem. And this problem is uh, something like this. I give you, I give you n numbers. Uh, n integers, let's say, and I ask you are there three numbers in the set of uh, n numbers which sum up to zero? Right? You can uh, you can uh, trivially do this in n cube time. Like you can just go through all possible uh, q triples of numbers and see whether they sum up to zero. But it turns out there are non-trivial algorithms which can do it in n squared time. And uh, and after several decades of research, people have not been able to improve upon this significantly. And uh, and and uh, and this problem turns out to be related to the complexity of lots of other problems in uh, in in lots of other graph theoretical problems, for example, lots of dynamic problems. And uh, and another example of such a problem is uh, the all pair shortest path problem on graphs, where I give you a graph and I ask you to give me the shortest distance between any two, uh, between all pa all pairs of points in the graph, all pairs of edges in the graph. Again, the complexity of this problem seems to be related to the complexity of lots of other problems, lots of graph theoretic problems. And uh, and another example of a problem which uh, which I will be defining shortly, because this is what I'll be using as the running example throughout the talk, is what is called the orthogonal vectors problem, which is again related to lots of problems like edit distance and so on. Uh, in, in all of these cases, uh, these are all problems in polynomial time. They, they have polynomial time algorithms, right? But the question is, what exactly is the polynomial there? Like how efficiently can you really solve them? And uh, and what do what do uh, statements about the efficiency, uh, about the complexity of these problems, imply for the complexity of other problems, right? And this uh, this uh, this is a study that has been going on for the past 20, 30 years. And these are some problems that have turned out to be really important because they are connected to lots of other problems, like I said. But, uh, but one thing about uh, the field of fine-grained complexity so far is that it has been a study of worst-case fine-grained complexity. Like you typically ask, uh, when, you, when you say the efficiency of solving a problem, so far you usually mean the efficiency of solving it in the worst case. Right? You want to be correct on all possible inputs. 
And what we asked in our uh, paper, what, what we, the questions that we tried to answer are, can you come up with a reasonable study of the average case analog of this, then, an average case fine grain complexity? Right? Can, you, can you relate the complexities of this problem, of solving these problems in the average case? And, uh, and 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 why would you why would you want to do that, right? Well, uh, there are so, there are lots of good reasons to study the average case complexity of problems. So for the the first and uh, and definitely not the least is the is that it is a very natural thing to study. It's uh, I would I would in fact claim that average case complexity, right? the study of solving problems on average, is is as natural as worst case complexity. Even though even though it's not the first thing you would think of when you say solving a problem, like you would, you would uh, the first thing you would think of is I want to solve it everywhere, right? But uh, but average case is not too far from that, and in fact the motivations for studying average case complexity usually is uh, are, are at least as good as those for studying worst case complexity. In fact, they claim that you take you take any statement which justifies studying worst case complexity, and you replace worst case with, with average case, and they claim that it would still make sense. And, uh, uh, it's, it's a very natural thing to study, and also, and also in several cases, it uh, it uh, it could uh, very easily be more reflective of the real world. For uh, one one striking example here is the case of satisfiability, right? Uh, so SAT is supposed to be NP hard; it's supposed to be very difficult to solve. But uh, but in practice, people solve SAT instances all the time. You have all these SAT solvers that work over lots of lots of different kinds of instances, and it could very well be that problems that are hard to solve in the worst case, when you encounter them in the wild, are uh, are actually easy because the instances that you see in uh, the, the instances that come up in applications of these problems are actually typically easy. So it, it, it really makes sense to study average case complexity in that sense. And uh, another very good reason to study average case complexity is that uh, it is necessary for cryptography. Right? When, you, when you construct cryptographic objects, you want them to work in the average case, on the average case. Like you, want them the, you want them to work most of the time, not just some of the time. You want to say that, oh, if this is a one-way function, then you can't invert this one-way function almost all of the time. Right? So you want problems which are hard on the average. You want the average case instances of your problems to be hard. So, so studying average case complexity is very important for this reason because it has these applications to cryptography, and uh, and another uh, reason that I will be in a better position to explain later in the talk is that it could possibly be used in actually designing algorithms. Like I know I know at least one very nice example where it is easier for to design algorithms for a certain problem in the average case, and then you can do something else to translate it to the worst case. You can you can. Uh, you can do what is called uh, a worst case to average case reduction, which is what the rest of this talk is actually going to be about, where you say, uh, I will take uh, problem A and problem B, and I will reduce solving problem A in the worst case to solving problem B in the average case over some distribution of instances. Right? And uh, I, I know at least one good example where it's, it's easy, it turns out to be easier to solve a certain problem in the average case and then reduce this other problem, for, uh, solving this other problem in the worst case to this problem in the average case. And, uh, and these kinds of uh, worst case to average case reductions are, are quite important because, uh, for, for the reason that uh, we do not actually know that much about average case complexity. Like we know a lot more about worst case complexity than we know about average case complexity. And if we want to translate this knowledge of things in the, in the realm of worst case complexity to average case complexity, then you need some nature of these worst case to average case reductions. Where you can say that if problem A is hard in the worst case, then problem B is actually hard in the average case. And, uh, and unfortunately, we do not know too many examples of such reductions. Um, we, know, we, know, we know certain examples, like, uh, like, like, like in the case of discrete log, for example, and, or in the case of lattice problems, we know, we know certain worst case to average case reductions. And historically, these reductions have been very useful for, in cryptography in particular, and, uh, and even otherwise. These, these such reductions have been quite useful. Uh, but we don't. But we don't really know that many examples. We know some examples in certain higher complexity classes, like in the case in in p space or exponential time. We know how to do these things in generically. But uh, reductions with certain polynomial time, we don't really know that, uh, very many. And and what we do in uh, oh, okay. and, uh, and 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 the the central thing that we do in our work is we give a new worst case to average case reduction. For uh, that is in, in the realm of fine grain complexity. What do I mean in the realm of fine grain complexity? Well, two things. First, it deals with the problems that I mentioned earlier that uh, I said were important for fine grain complexity. Right? It, it, it relates the complexity of solving those problems in the worst case to certain other problem, to solving certain other problems in the average case. And, uh, and the second is that our reductions are very tight. They are very efficient. So you can actually take arguments about the, the, the fine grain complexity of the problems that I was talking about earlier, and you, you, you undertake this average case reductions. It gives you statements about 
the average case fine grain complexity of certain other problems. Rather than just saying this is a polynomial time reduction, we can actually nail down the length of the reduction and it turns out to be very efficient. Right? And, uh, and yeah, so this is what I'm going to tell you about. Uh, and uh, I'm going to do, so I'm, I'm first going to tell you about the, uh, to, uh, define the problems that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and I'm going to show, show you the, um, prove the average case show you and prove the average case reduction. Then, uh, then I will show you one application of uh, of the average case reduction we have, which is a construction of a proof of work scheme. Right. Um, yeah. So let me start by defining the problem I left out earlier. Right. The, this is this problem called orthogonal vectors. Uh, there are lots of ways of defining this problem, and I'm going to define it the way that's convenient for me. Right. So the, the problem is as follows: You are given two sets of vectors so you should think about these as two sets of vectors two sets of uh, of zero one vectors like the like each row here is a vector and uh, two and there are n vectors in each set and the dimension of each vector is d right and i ask you the question i give you the zero one vectors and i ask you the question is there a pair of vectors one in the first set another in the second set that are disjoint right for example i think uh, like this and that are not disjoint because they have a one in the same place over there but this and this are disjoint because wherever this has a one, this has a zero, and the other way around also. This is what I mean by disjoint. If there's no position where both of them have a one. Right? This is the orthogonal vectors problem. It's called orthogonal vectors because like if you if you take these vectors that are disjoint, then they'll be orthogonal over the integers or something. Right? So this is a and this is a, a pretty well studied problem. It, it has connections to lots of other problems. In uh, for example, it, it relates pretty closely to questions like uh, uh, computing the edit distance between strings or completing the least common subsequence, so what is the no, last one, least, what is that called? The longest common subsequence on the least. And it, it has connections to lots of other problems. And, uh, and the, the, so, and, and how, how, uh, how did you solve this? So what is the, one trivial algorithm to solve this is to go through all possible pairs of vectors and check if they're disjoint, right? And that takes like n squared times d time, the n squared pairs of vectors and d time to check each of those. Oh yes, yeah. So uh, the the trivial algorithm for this takes n squared times d time, and uh, the best algorithm known so far is from a couple of years ago by Abud Williams and you, and it works in this much time. So what is this? This is uh, it's slightly better than n squared, but it's not that much better. Uh, like for example, if uh, like if, if d is some constant times log n, then this is two minus some constant. But if d, for example, is log squared n, right? Then uh, this is one over log log n, and this is two minus one over log log n, which is more than two minus any constant. Like it's more than one point nine nine, it's more than one point nine nine nine. So it's uh, if d is uh, d is strictly more than log n, then this is uh, this is still almost quadratic. Right? And this is the best algorithm we know. And uh, and the conjecture, the standing conjecture right now after after decades of work on this, is that this is roughly the best you can do. That uh, that if your d is uh, a lot more than log n. Then it actually takes n to the two minus the of one time. That you can't do it in into the one point nine time. And uh, and this conjecture it turns out is implied by uh, what is called the the strong exponential time hypothesis. Uh, the strong exponential time hypothesis is this is this um, is this hypothesis about this conjecture about the complexity of the satisfied formula on n instance on, on n variables. Then it actually takes two to the n time to solve two to the n times to decide whether it's satisfiable not as opposed to taking like two to the n over two time or two to the three n over four time it says it takes two to the n time right and uh, uh, and it turns out that this conjecture is implied by the strong experimental time hypothesis and people believe this conjecture is, uh, i believe a lot more than the strong experimental time hypothesis upon which opinion is slightly divided in the community um, but yeah, so this uh, th that's about this problem, right? The orthogonal vectors problem, and uh, and this is the problem that we are going to. Okay, so this is the problem I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. But whatever I'm going to say applies to the other problems I mentioned as well, like the three sum and all pairs short as part. Like what I'm going to say applies to that. But it's simplest to discuss this problem, so I'm discussing this problem. And uh, yeah, so this is the problem that we will be reducing from. So we will be showing that uh, solving this problem in the worst case reduces to solving another problem in the average case. And what is this problem that in the average case that we'll be dealing with? Uh, oh yeah, so we'll also be, uh, for simplicity, we'll be taking setting the dimension to be log squared n. Uh, so it applies for a huge range of parameters. Let's say it's log squared n. And it, uh, right. And uh, yeah, what is this average case problem? It's, uh, it is going to be the problem of evaluating a certain polynomial. Right? 
uh, and uh, we are going to construct this polynomial and uh, along the way you'll see why it makes sense right so i'm going to define this polynomial f i'm going to call it f throughout and it's defined on these uh, on the same set of variables like, like the uh, n times t variables here n times t variables there just like an instance of the orthogonal vectors problem and uh, and we start by considering the following expression, right? So you take any row here, any row here, and consider this expression. Uh, what is this expression? Well, the, the property this has that I'm interested in is that uh, if these two rows happen to be disjoint, then this expression is one. Why? Because the fact that it's disjoint means that all of these small products are zero, which means all of these things are one, so the whole thing is one. Whereas if it is not disjoint, then there is one coordinate where it's both one, right? So this both of these will be one, and this whole thing this will become zero. So the whole thing will become zero. So if I if I if I take the evaluation of this expression, uh, where I put uh, like a zero one vector here and a zero one vector there, it will tell me exactly whether it is uh, disjoint or not, right? And the polynomial I'm going to take over inputs over these uh, variables as inputs is uh, the sum of this expression over all possible rows here and all possible rows here. Well, and what does this mean? It means that if I, if I take my input to be uh, zeros and ones, like all of these, if I set all these variables to be zeros and ones, then this will actually tell me the number of paths of disjoint vectors in this instance. Right? That is the significance of this thing. And uh, so, so immediately, if you, can, if you can compute this polynomial, if you can evaluate this polynomial on any given input, then you can decide the orthogonal vectors problem immediately. And you just evaluate this, and it tells you how many paths of orthogonal vectors are there. And that's, that's what you need to know. That's, that's more than you need to know, right? And, uh, and, and uh, so this is the polynomial I'm going to consider. And I'm going to consider this over a certain finite field. The reason will be clear soon. Uh, I'm going to take a field of characteristic more than n squared. Uh, I'm going to take a, uh, uh, to make it simple, I'm going to take a uh, prime p which is more than n squared, and I'm going to define this polynomial over fp. It's the same polynomial, but I'm just going to consider it over fp. Why more than n squared? It's so that, uh, it's so that the semantics I said earlier still makes sense. That you're, you're adding n squared terms here, each of which is 0 or 1, in the case of a 0, 1 input, right? You are adding uh, n squared terms, and you don't want it to wrap around, so that, it, uh, so that the statement I made earlier is still correct. That if I put in a 0, 1 input, it tells me the number of paths of orthogonal vectors. As long as it's p is more than n squared, what I said is still correct. And it's still true that if I can evaluate this, then I can uh, solve any instance of orthogonal vectors, right? And uh, so this is the problem we are going to reduce to. That we are going to say that the, uh, solving this problem on average is uh, as hard as solving the earlier problem in the worst case. And uh, and I would like to point before going to uh, so, uh, going on to say how to do that, I, I want to point out two properties of this polynomial. The first is that it is uh, its degree is not very high. Uh, like uh, this, the degree is just the product of all these things. So right? you are multiplying two d, d things here, and each, each is a product of two things. And uh, so the degree is 2D, at most 2D, it's just 2D. And, uh, and D is pretty small. Like we took D to be log squared, right? So the degree of this polynomial is pretty small. It's, um, and uh, that's the first thing I want to point out. The second thing I want to point out is that you can actually evaluate this in almost quadratic time. Like you, by simply going through all of these terms, and evaluating them takes like, D time or uh, some con some d times uh, there are some factors about uh, like which are like logarithmic in the size of the field size in the size of the field but let's ignore that for now right we'll be ignoring logarithmic factors in whatever we were talking about anyway uh, so in roughly n squared time like just by going through all these terms you can co you can evaluate this polynomial and these are the two things i want to point out now they'll come in while we're doing the reduction right and uh, and yeah so what do what can we prove with this this is what we can prove that uh, that if you have an algorithm that runs in time n to the 1 plus alpha for some alpha greater than 0, and on a random input x computes uh, f correctly, even with a relatively small probability, like it, uh, the, uh, this is, uh, what is what is 1 over n to the little of 1? It's, it's some quantity which is uh, smaller than any 1 over polylog, and, and larger than any 1 over polynomial. Right? It, it's still pretty small. So note that you can actually uh, guess uh, f correctly with probability 1 over p, which is going to be like 1 over n squared, by just guessing at random, because those are the, all the possibilities you have. Uh, what this is saying is that if you have an algorithm which does somewhat better than that, uh, then you can use that algorithm uh, to, get an to get another algorithm which runs in almost the same amount of time, and which decides the orthogonal vector problem, which solves the orthogonal vector problem in the worst case. Right? And, uh, 
And the corollary of this is that uh, if the earlier conjecture I mentioned is true, is that if orthogonal vectors actually takes almost quadratic time, then uh, evaluating f takes almost quadratic time on the average case on, on uniformly random inputs. I, I give you a random input and you have to evaluate it, and uh, subquadratic algorithms are going to be bad at this. Um, right. So this is the, this, this is what we are going to prove. And uh, any questions so far? Okay, so yeah, so let me show you the reduction then. Uh, so I'm going to show you, and uh, so, and yeah, okay. So uh, the, the I'm going to show you how to prove the theorem that I just stated. And it uses certain ideas from uh, from the literature on showing similar reductions for the for the permanent problem. Like there has been this uh, line of work on showing uh, worst case to average case reductions for the permanent. And uh, certain techniques were developed for this, and and I've also found use elsewhere. And uh, and these techniques we are going to use over here. Uh, and these are also related to techniques and related to lots of things in, in coding theory, like listic, local listic or local decoding of codes, local decoding of variable code, everything. Right. And, uh, and so 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 yeah. So so you have this function f, uh, which is this polynomial f of degree 2d. And in fact, uh, for the first part of the direction, at least the only fact we are going to use about this f is that it's a low degree polynomial over a large enough field. Right? And uh, you have an uh, algorithm A which works. Uh, so let's start by uh, proving a weaker version of a theorem. Right? So I said, I said that uh, any algorithm A which succeeds with probability 1 over into little of 1, I can use in my reduction. But we are going to start with something weaker. We are going to say, take any algorithm A which is quite good at computing f on the average. It can compute it with uh, probably 0 0.9 on the average. On, on 90 percent of the inputs, it's correct. Right? Take any algorithm like this, which runs in so much time, and we are going to construct an algorithm B, which will work on all inputs with certain probability. And this is what we're going to do. And this, uh, and like I said earlier, if you can compute f on all inputs, then you can decide orthogonal vectors by simply by evaluating it on the instance you have. So this would prove. If you can show this, then this would prove a weaker version of the theorem. So our, up to up to this being smaller. Right. And how are we going to do this? Well, let me describe how B works, right? So what, is, so what does B get? B gets us input uh, an X. So let this be the space of FP to the 2ND, right? This is the space of all your inputs. B gets an input X over here, right? And uh, that is, uh, and uh, B has access to A, which claims to be correct on 90% of the instances. It is wrong on certain a certain part of the instances, and uh, but B does not know where this lies. Right? This the, there's a certain set of instances where A is wrong, but B doesn't know what these instances are, and B has to work regardless. Uh, what B does is uh, it uh, it takes this input, and it takes a, a random line through its input in the space. Right? It uh, how does it do that? Well, it, it picks a random y in the space, and it considers the line x plus y times t. This is a random line in the space that passes through x. Right? And then it looks at the restriction of the polynomial f to this line. What do I mean by that? I mean this univariate polynomial, g of t, which is you take x plus y times t and evaluate f at that point. So this is a univariate polynomial right? with, the, with these two properties, that, uh, that if you evaluate it at 0, you get the answer you want. If you evaluate it correctly at 0, then you get the answer you want. And its, it's degree is the same as that of d, that, that of f, it's 2d. Uh, because uh, you, can, you can think of that as like, you, you consider every monomial in F and, and think of what happens if you replace it with uh, like x y plus y a times t. You, you get that it's the, like the, the degree of this univariate polynomial is the same as the degree of this polynomial. Right? So it, can, it takes this, uh, this, the restriction of F to this line and, uh, and, it, and, the, and it's going to take several points on this line. Uh, how many points? It's going to take uh, some constant times d. Uh, I, I believe that for this setting of parameters, C can be something like 5 or some 5 or 10 or something, and this will work. So what it does, it takes all these points on this line, and it, uh, it evaluates A at those points. Right? And, and it's going to hope that, uh, that A is correct on most of these points. So what guarantee does A give you? A says, if you give me a completely random point from the space, I will be correct with probability 0.9. Right? Uh, but B is not giving it completely random points. Right? These are correlated points. So you don't have the same guarantee. But uh, one property you still have is that each of these points by itself, if you, by, if you look at it by itself, it's a completely random point. Right? And uh, so this says that, uh, that over all possible lines, all possible lines through x, the expected fraction of points on that line on which a is correct is uh, at least 0.9. Uh, to put it differently, the expected number of, uh, the expected fraction of points 
on uh, over all the lines on which a is wrong is at most 0.1 right so uh, the next, then a simple markov bond will tell you that uh, the probability that if you take a random line a is wrong on more than a 0.3 fraction of these points is at most one third like 0.1 by 0.3 more one third right uh, so if I take a random line and run uh, uh, run a on all these, uh, I take these five times d points and run a, a on all of these, uh, uh, with probability at least two thirds, seventy percent of these evaluations are going to be correct. So I'm going to I'm going to use a to compute all of these, and seventy percent of these evaluations would be correct. Right? And uh, and once I have this uh, guarantee that seventy percent of my evaluations are correct, I can uh, error correct the uh, these evaluations to get the value of f of x. What do I mean by this? Uh, uh, so th uh, this, uh, this this object, right, where I take a univariate polynomial and evaluate it over different points in the field, is just a reed solomon code, like where, where the, the G is the message of the code, and uh, this, this set of evaluations is the code word. And, uh, and by choosing my C to be large enough, I can guarantee that I can correct uh, from a 30% fraction of errors. Using, using like the, for example, the Bella Campbell shall go through. It tells you that uh, as long as the, the number of errors, the fraction of errors you have is not more than some constant. Like you can, you can adjust your C, that's, the, that's how you decide what your C has to be, uh, depending on what fraction of errors you want to tolerate. And if you set C to be something like five, it'll tell you that if, if, I, if I take these noisy evaluations and I have the guarantee that 70% of these are correct, then running the Bella Campbell shall go through will actually give you all the coefficients of G. Uh, it'll run in uh, time that is, uh, some polynomial in the degree, which is quite small, and it will give you the coefficients of the polynomial d, and then you, you can evaluate it yourself at, at zero and find the value of f of x. Right. And uh, yeah, this is what I said earlier that the probability that there are too many of uh, the, there are too many of the points on the line on which a is wrong is, is small. So with uh, so with probability at least two thirds, you will you will correctly compute the value of f of x. And this is true for any x, right? And this is how b works. So b takes this random line and it evaluates a on this line, and an er error corrects from this, right? And uh, so this gets you point nine. Uh, how are we going to improve this? Uh, so one thing you can do to so one thing you can do is you can instead of taking a random line through x, you can think of taking a random higher degree curve. Like you can take a random quadratic curve through x. You can take x plus y t plus z t squared. And uh, and that will let you get better guarantees on the noise on the on the fraction on which a is correct. Like the behavior will become closer to what a is at random. So you'll be able to say something like uh, uh, even if uh, even if the probability that a is correct is slightly more than a half, is some half plus delta for some constant delta, you will be able to carry out the reduction uh, because you will be able to argue that on this higher degree curve, uh, a behaves very similar to how it behaves on random points. Uh, but this sort of an approach is not going to get you much better than half. For the reason that uh, this error correcting step, right? You are doing this. Uh, you are saying I have this noisy code word, and I'm going to decode it. Uh, if your error, if your fraction of errors is more than half, you have no hope of doing this right? because there's no there's no one code word that is close enough to this. Uh, there is, I mean, there are more than there's too many code words that are close enough to this. There's no way of decoding it. Uh, but one thing you can do in such a case is this decoding, where you say, okay, I have this code word which is it's corrupted. Maybe only 30% of it is correct. And you can ask, oh, okay, fine. Give me the list of uh, all possible code words near this corrupted code word, which are which are which are uh, like 30% correlated to this corrupted code word, which could possibly have been the actual code word from which you obtained this corrupted code word by corrupting a few things, right? And uh, and you can and turns out that you can exploit this to get better reductions. Like so far, the only property we used is that f is a low degree polynomial, right? We haven't used anything else. But in order to exploit the, this list decoding, we turns out you need certain other properties which f fortunately turns out to have. And uh, I'm not going to be able to, yes. So this reduction gives you this probabilistic, it works for all x, mm -hmm. but you only get a probabilistic yes. answer. Yes. Are you going to fix that later, or is No, that? I do not know how to fix that. Ah. Uh, and in general, this is a, like you, you could, uh, and, and sort of the like the there is a there is a sort, there is sort of barrier to doing this right because you are uh, you are working with an algorithm which works over random instances, 
So there is a small chance that it is wrong on whatever you ask it. You're only going to ask it a small number of queries. And there's going to be a certain, certain probability that it's going to be wrong on all these queries. And uh, it doesn't seem like there should be a way to fix this. Maybe, maybe you can somehow exploit the structure of this problem to do this. But in general, I don't think this is something that should be possible to fix. But no, we are not going to do that. Yeah. Any other questions so far? So in C, it depends on the probability, or it also depends on what line or the curve you draw for the point? Uh, okay, so C depends on uh, the probability here and the like, degree of the curve you take. But uh, typically, it's not usually more, that much more useful to take the degree to be more than 2. Like, you get very good uh, values of C even, for, even, for, even if you take a quadratic curve through this. But yeah, th those are two things it depends on. And even for quadratic curves, it's not that big. It's something like 25 or something. And, uh, any other questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so what have we done so far? Already, it already gives us a reduction, right? It's still a non-trivial worst case to average case reduction. And uh, yeah, if you want to go further, you need to exploit certain properties that this polynomial, that our polynomial has, that not all polynomials have. And uh, uh, oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. So this is a, so this is important, right? I have to tell you this. I have to tell you what the running time is because I claim that my reduction is very efficient. Right? And if you want to argue that this is still in the realm of fine grain complexity, you have to look at this very carefully. And uh, so, what is the running time of the reduction? It's uh, well, you have to uh, you, you have to go through c times d points. You have to write down the points that takes this much time. You absorb the constant into the over notation, right? Forget about the constant. It takes this much time, and then you have to call the algorithm a on all of these points then takes t time at each point and the c time t points and then you have to run the error correcting algorithm which takes this much time and uh, and if your uh, t is said to be n to the 1 plus alpha then you will find that this is a dominating term and uh, and if your d is log squared n which is what we took it to be then uh, ignoring log factors you, you get uh, that this is something like o tilde of t the o tilde means that it hides like log poly log factors in the arguments right so this gives you yeah, and, and notice that this relies crucially on d being pretty small, right? If d was too big, then for example, if d was uh, like n, this would tell you that uh, t cannot be more than n. If you start with uh, something that, uh, so you're going to start by saying, the, if you want to go the other way in the direction, you, you'll be saying something like, f cannot be computed in the worst case in time n squared, right? That will translate to a statement here saying that f cannot be computed on the average over in time n which is not really meaningful. You need time and to read the whole thing anyway. Uh, so, so we crucially use the fact that D is small, but that's all that we used. We didn't use any of the properties. Uh, uh, and the other running time is almost the same. Like given that D is small, the running time is almost the same as A. Uh, yeah, so we've done this so far. And uh, it turns out that if you want to do more, you have to use the properties of our polynomial. And uh, this is our polynomial, right? You have the sum over uh, all these rows and this product over there. And the property that we are going to use is that you can split these sums as follows. That, uh, that these are uh, sums over n values, right, 1 to n and 1 to n. We, we can split this into four sums over n over 2 values. And the first is from i, I go from i and j both go from 1 to n over 2, and then there's n over 2 to n, and so on. You can split this into a sum of four different polynomials. And, uh, and, the, and the thing to notice here is that all of these smaller polynomials are actually the same polynomial as what we started with. Only you're summing it up over a smaller number of uh, smaller values of this n, right? And this property is called downward self-reducibility. Like you're reducing the problem to itself uh, downwardly. You're reducing it to solving smaller instances of the same problem. Right? And uh, and it was shown by like Kai Pound and Sivakumar over there that uh, so the, the the so that uh, that they also worked in the context of the permanent the, like I mentioned earlier. And the permanent also has some similar properties, like the, and they showed how to exploit this kind of a property to do better average case reductions. Uh, and it goes through list decoding, like you say. Uh, uh, in, like, w roughly, the idea is that instead of say, taking a random curve through your point, you take a random curve that passes through all these small points, all these smaller points. You go to the smaller space, and you, you have four points. You take a random curve that goes through all four of these points, and then you would ask, uh, you would again do, you, you would run A on lots of points on this curve, and uh, and then you do list decoding. This will give you a lot of possibilities for. Uh, 
for the for the correct uh, restriction of f to this this curve, and then you have to find out which one is the correct uh, restriction. And and you do and then you recurse. You 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 take one point on this curve, and then you recurse. You apply this downward self reducibility again. You get uh, you get four small four instances of state and over four, and then you keep doing this until you get two constant states. This is roughly the idea. Uh, I can say more about this later if we have time. But uh, but this do, but doing this using list decoding along with this property lets you get uh, the get what I promised you earlier that if that if, if you have an algorithm A which does even slightly well even slightly better than Gessie Contradon then you can get what you want. You you pay a little more in the running time but not much more. You can dictate the one plus at of one. And uh, yeah, this is the reduction. Like this, this proves the theorem. Right? This is says that if you can solve this in the average, you can solve it in the worst case in almost the same time. The, and to yeah, so to summarize this, this is what we have. Right? We have a worst average case reduction from uh, and like I said, so I showed you the orthogonal vectors problem, but you can do the same things for the other problems that you mentioned earlier as well. And uh, we have this, but in addition, you have this that the polynomial f you get, which is which we the average case polynomial has certain properties because so if I, if I did not have these properties right then it's not that interesting because you can actually like I said earlier for any problem in p space or any problem in exp you can get and uh, you can get a reduction to a certain other problem in p space or exp uh, an average case reduction to a certain other problem in p space or exp the reason this is not that interesting is that uh, the problem you get the problem you reduce to does not have any interesting properties. It, it, the reduction is not useful in any other sense. Like you don't, you, the, the the problem you're reducing to does not have properties that you can exploit to construct other objects from it or exploit to say other things about this problem. But fortunately, our problem, because we tailored it, because we were careful in constructing it, has these other properties that it is low degree and uh, importantly that it is somewhat efficiently computable. That it can actually be computed in Odell Dauphin's point time, and it has its own vessel reducibility properties, right? And uh, uh, and we will, uh, and I will show you an example of uh, how to use this, how how it turns out actually to be useful uh, in in uh, to construct uh, what you would call a proof of work scheme. And uh, yeah, and we would, we'll need one more property of this polynomial to do that, uh, which is this theorem that was proven by Williams last year, uh, who he showed that uh, this polynomial has. Uh, is very can be efficiently certified that if I, if I take this polynomial f and I want to prove to you that f of x equal to y, you give me x, I come up with a y and I want to prove to you that f of x is equal to y, I can do this somewhat efficiently. That I can run in time like n squared, which is also this time it takes to compute f of x itself. Right? I can run in this much time and I can come up with a proof and I can come up with a certificate that I'll give to you and you will be able to verify. Uh, this is this certificate that f of x is e in fact equal to the y that I gave you in almost linear time. Right. And uh, we are going to use this certifiability property of this polynomial to uh, to do to do what I'm going to show you next. Uh, I mean soundness error. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, negligible soundness error. Not negligible soundness would be a little more disastrous. Yeah, it's not not. Negligible. So for the other problems, you also construct different polynomials and you Yes, yes, yes. You can do all this. So you can take uh, Ryan's techniques, what he does, and you can and, and you take the polynomial that you get by doing what we did over here. So, uh, so what we did was we wrote down this polynomial, which actually evaluates to the answer for the orthogonal vectors problem in certain instances, right? You you can you do this for the three sum and APST problems as well. It turns out you can do this, uh, which is which is which is actually uh, fortunate because it, it's not. It's not clear that it, it, this has to be satisfied. It's not clear that, you, that there has to be a polynomial of this small degree which uh, which works which works through a reduction for any of these problems. It just happens to be the case. And, uh, and yeah, you do that, and then this theorem would, would uh, cover those as well. It would also give you uh, uh, a similar statement saying that you can certify evaluations of these polynomials such that you can verify the certificates faster than it takes to faster than evaluating the whole polynomial itself. Uh, yeah, any other questions? Okay, uh, so yeah, so so like I said, right? The 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 polynomial that we have, our f, has all these properties, and uh, and this is what makes these reductions interesting, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be as interesting. But and here's an example of an application of this reduction, right? So we are going to construct. A, so I'm going to show you a protocol. I'm not going to define the proof of work scheme right now. I'm going to show you a protocol, and then we'll see what it does, right? So you have the prover and the verifier. 
the verifier picks a random input from the space that we discussed earlier. It sent it over to the prover. And the prover is supposed to evaluate f on this input to come up with a z, and also come up with the proof that uh, f of x is equal to z. And then the verifier will uh, verify this and will accept if the proof verifies. Right? Uh, so what, how, uh, what are the efficiencies of the prover and the verifier? Well, by what we discussed earlier, the, so the verifier, this, this is a trivial task. And this, we just said that it takes linear time. Right? We are going to use the protocol from the previous theorem. It says it takes linear time. And the theorem also says that the prover's task is also only, also only takes uh, n squared time. You can, com can compute this proof pi in n squared time. Right? And, uh, and, for, and, and, and the, and the for one other property that this has is that if the prover actually runs in less than n squared time, then it can't even compute the z correctly, right? Because that's what we uh, assuming, okay, assuming that orthogonal vectors takes n squared time, uh, the prover cannot even compute z correctly on this random input because that is what we proved. If orthogonal vectors takes n squared time, then evaluating this polynomial in an average takes n squared time. Right, and uh, and in fact, if you work through the numbers, this is what you'll get: that if the prover, that if the orthogonal vector's conjecture is true, that if it actually takes almost quadratic time, then if the if the prover runs in time into the two minus epsilon, then the probability that this whole thing succeeds is like one over n to the epsilon over two. And which says that which says that if the prover actually makes the verifier accept, then it has proven on on average that that it has worked for n squared and that it has put in n squared steps of computation into this. Right? And this is what you, you refer to as a proof of work. That it, the prover has proven that it, it has invested work into this. Right? And this has lots of applications. Like it was, um, it was, uh, I believe it was, uh, I, I, may, I may not be uh, attributing this correctly, but I believe uh, the first applications for these were proposed by Dworkin now in 1992, where they said you can use this sort of thing, for example, to combat spam. Like you can, whenever someone wants to send you an email, you make them do this. You make them spend some effort and make it expensive to send you an email so that people can't spam other people. Right? And, uh, and and recently there have been a lot more applications of proof of work. Uh, like you can find these in cryptocurrencies, for example, where they are, they are, they are pretty central. And uh, yeah, so, and, and I actually haven't, uh, so there are certain other properties you need, uh, there's, there's at least one other property is you typically need from a proof of work scheme, which I have not mentioned, which is that, uh, which is that you cannot amortize a proof of work over different instances, like, uh, like if, so we proved that, assuming that the orthogonal vector context is true, we proved that if I give you a random instance of size n, then the prover takes uh, n squared time, right? But uh, what about the following possibility? Maybe if I give the prover n to the 10 instances of size n, maybe the prover can run in n to the 11 time and solve all of those instances, right? And this is something that it turns out is undesirable in certain applications of a proof of work scheme. But, uh, but it turns out that in our case, in the construction we have, uh, because of one of the properties I mentioned earlier, because of the downward self reducibility property, you can actually prove that this cannot be done. That assuming the orthogonal vector's conjecture, you can prove that if I give you n to the 10 instances of size n, then you have to run in n to the 12 time. Otherwise, you will be wrong on some of these instances. Uh, yeah, and this is uh, again th this is this is something that actually surprised us. Like this is not a property that like, we didn't construct these polynomials to have these properties. Right? It just turned out to have all these nice properties. And uh, and, and, and yeah, so this is uh, uh, these are all the technical things I had to say. Any, any questions about the proof of work? Okay. Oh, yeah. But do you know that there is a generic way of amplifying prover's work uh, so that you have greater variance between the prover and verifier ah. at times? So like composing f somehow non-trivial is so that I don't know you have quadratic growth in the prover's work but only linear growth in the verifier's work. Okay. So I actually don't know a generic way to amplify that. Uh, it's possible that maybe I just don't know it. But but one thing I can say is that there are. Uh, there are other things you can do apart from what is this. Like, there are certain other problems. Well, for example, uh, you can take, you take the orthogonal vectors problem, right? I said you have, the problem is that you have these two sets of vectors, and I ask you if there's a pair, one in, one in each set, that are orthogonal. I can generalize this problem slightly and say I'll give you three sets of vectors. Is there a triple, like one in each set, such that they, the generalized inner product that uh, is, is, is zero? Such that at every coordinate, at least one of these vectors is zero. This is another problem I can ask you, and, uh, and it turns out that you can prove from again from the strong exponential time hypothesis and, uh, and and even other ways. It's generally believed that this problem, for example, takes n cube time, and if you run this problem through through this reduction, 
uh, or you can even do it for higher values. Uh, you can take four sets or five sets or some k sets more generally. And it turns out that if you run that through this reduction, you can show that uh, assuming that the strong exponential time hypothesis, for example, uh, that this problem, that the, the you'll get a different polynomial, that that polynomial takes n to the k time to evaluate as opposed to uh, n squared here. And you can use that over here to get, uh, you'll get an interactive proof of work. But there you can actually get these things. You can you can you get a proof of work where the prover runs in n to the prover has to run in n to the k time. The verifier still runs in n time, almost n time. And so you can get these. I don't know how to so I, that's the answer. I don't know how to generically amplify this, but uh, you can do things here using this framework to get good better parameters, better separations. Uh, anything else? Okay. Uh, so yeah. So this. Uh, so this is this is one example. Right? This is one example of uh, of why of uh, of how of how studying average case fine grain complexity specifically can be useful. Like this this construction, for example, you could not have done simply with an average case complexity consideration. Uh, this, we really use this fine grainness. We use this property that the prover can run in n square time because you also want that. You want the prover to be able to convince you if he does spend n square time, right? So, and this, so this, is, this is a very good example of why it's uh, useful, why the, of what sort of applications there can be for average case fine grain complexity. And, uh, and this is just the beginning, right? The, the, this is, uh, so we have, uh, these are just the first reductions that we have been able to find. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot more over here that is to be found. Right? And, uh, and there, are lots, there are lots of questions to ask here, right? And uh, specifically, you can ask about, uh, so, so the proof of uh, proof of work is a uh, is like one of the simplest cryptographic primitives. You can ask about higher cryptographic primitives. You can ask, for example, you can start with one-way functions, and you can ask, can you construct one-way functions which uh, which I can compute forwards in linear time, but you can't invert in quadratic time. Like I can ask questions like this, and you can ask this for encryption schemes. And all, all these questions make sense, right? Because uh, because uh, uh, typically in theoretical cryptography, you, you, you argue about, you talk about uh, these constructions which are secure against polynomial time adversaries. But, uh, but more or less the, about the only reason for doing this, okay, there are two reasons for doing this, I think. W the first is what I said earlier for complexity, right? That, uh, that polynomials are a very good model of efficiency for theoretical study because they compose well and everything. And you can multiply polynomials. Right? And the second is composability. Like if, if you can, if you, if you compose two one-way functions, you want to say it's still hard and things like that. Uh, so these are the reasons that uh, typically in cryptography we study the, our adversarial model is polynomial time algorithms. But I want to say that it actually makes a lot of sense to think about to ha consider adversarial models where your adversary is is may maybe not an n to the 10 time algorithm. Right? Maybe you don't care that someone who runs in time n to the 10 can break your scheme because it's too big anyway. Maybe all you care about is that someone who runs in less than n cube is not able to break it. Maybe that's good enough for you. Because because your n is big enough and n cube itself is really huge and this is good enough. Right? And, uh, and, and, and moving to considerations like moving to primitives like this would enable you to start from weaker assumptions. Right? It may allow you to uh, start with weaker assumptions than what we use right now. Maybe you don't need, the strength, need all the strength of the assumptions we use right now. Maybe you can, maybe you can uh, start with more plausible assumptions. And uh, maybe someday you can even get, uh, maybe someday you won't even need assumptions, maybe sooner than this. Like, for example, this sort of notion makes sense even if p is equal to np. Right? Even if p is equal to np, you can ask these questions. Uh, the, there will still be algorithm, there will still be problems that you cannot solve in time in cube. And you can ask, uh, uh, can we do this thing? Can we can we have meaningful cryptographic primitives? And uh, and this is the first step towards all of this. You you start you ask uh, are there average case hard problems for for these polynomial time algorithms? And uh, and uh, yeah, so th th so, th so there's a lot of there are a lot of things to do here. And uh, and and and, there are, and even outside cryptography, there are lots of questions to be asked in this domain, right? And, uh, and perhaps the most important of these is to ask about the original problems themselves. Like you are, what, what we did here, we started with all these problems that are important for fine grain complexity, and we reduced to certain other problems. And these other problems are useful because, uh, to us are useful because they, they give us all these things, they give us proofs of work, for example. But, uh, but it would be a lot more interesting if, uh, if you can actually argue something about the average complexity of the problems that you started with themselves. Because these these have repercussions for certain other problems, right? So that, so this is one very big question over here. Can you come up with meaningful uh, distributions over over these problems, which are themselves hard, assuming the worst case hardness of these things? And uh, and this is what I was talking about earlier: like fine-grained cryptography. Right? 
uh, ask about one-way functions or encryption schemes which are secure against certain problem and time adversaries. Uh, and uh, ah, okay. And this uh, this is the other thing that I mentioned in the beginning. The other side I've been in a better position to talk about later, right? Uh, in algorithm design, for example, for example, suppose you wanted to design an algorithm for the optical vectors problem. Because of this reduction, uh, it is sufficient to design an algorithm for the polynomial that comes out that works on average. You don't have to even work on all all inputs. As long as it works on average, you can go back in the reduction and get a worst case algorithm for optical vectors, right? And uh, I have not seen this too often. I have not seen this paradigm of designing algorithms too often. But I know some very good examples, very nice examples that I can tell you about later if you want me to. Uh, so this is a possibility. This, this is one reason why this why it could be useful to study these reductions for problems which are already solved in polynomial time. And uh, and yes, and the last thing is whether you can take the reductions I have, I have shown you and make them better in terms of the parameters. Uh, like, like for example, right now I said that uh, as long as the average case algorithm works with the probability one over into a little of one, you can do this reduction. But what about what if it works with probability one over square root of n? Then the reduction doesn't work. But uh, but can you actually do that? Can you come up with a better reduction that works? That's, that's another question. And, uh, yeah. So this, this this is all I had to say. Any any questions? Yes. He was looked at exponential versus polynomial. He was looking at, at gave an example of something one might use, and that was quadratic versus linear. Yeah. So that's, that's that's actually the original idea. Yes, 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 yes. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. So. So this is sort of where cryptography sort of started out, right? When the beginning, people were asking these questions: like, can you construct things which can, which you can compute in, in time n, but you can't break in time n squared? So people were asking these questions. Uh, it's only later that uh, cryptography moved to the more complexity theoretic. Uh, it adopted the idioms of complexity theory and said, let's move. Okay, we can we have the statements in complexity theory about uh, polynomial time algorithms. Let's see whether they can use this, right? But yeah, so this sort of question has been asked from right from the beginning, and uh, and there has been work in different dimensions. In fact, like Merkel's paper, like you mentioned, this is a linear versus quadratic running time, and uh, uh, he actually gives an example. Like in the presence of a random oracle, he gives an example of a of a key agreement protocol where the honest part is running time n, and it proves that it's hard for any adversary running in time less than n squared to break this. And uh, and these other works, right? So these are actually they they work in other dimensions of fine grainedness like so far we have been, we talked about running time right we have said uh, 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 the honest party is running this much time the adversary is running that much time and so on but you can also consider the other notions of complexity Hastad, for example uh, considers circuit depth as a measure of complexity and he shows that uh, there are functions that you can compute in nc0 in constant depth that you can't invert even in even use even in ac0 which is a constant depth with unbounded fine right? and uh, and and uh, and BGA is an improve. They they improve the assumptions for what Berkeley did. And DVB again is about secure depth. They have give other constructions for secure depth. And, uh, yeah. So there are also these other dimensions. And, uh, and this question, this sort of like you said, this sort of question has been asked right from the beginning. But uh, but now we have the machinery to be able to attempt these attempt to answer these questions from a complexity theoretic point of view because we have this fine grain complexity theory that has been going on for a while, and we have a certain set of beliefs that we have. We know things there. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, thanks, thanks.